Well, um, welcome everyone. My name is Javier Corrales, and I teach in the political science department here at Amherst. Thank you so much for coming to uh, my talk this afternoon entitled The Most Anti-American Governments of Latin America, Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia. Um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about how I was going to do this and whether I was going to do something very political science-y and, and testing some hypotheses or instead try to give you a little bit of description of uh, what these governments are about and what's going on here. Um, and I decided, I hope you accept it and like it, I decided not to give to make it that political science-y but to try to be somewhat descriptive which has a downside with all descriptive things is that I have many slides to show you uh, and I hope that we have the appetite for it but I think you're gonna I hope that you enjoy it and you don't feel a little overwhelmed by the data and that you can at least get the main message that I would like to convey uh, uh, to all of you um, and that is that this notion of anti-Americanism, uh, everybody knows that we live in a world of uh, uh, um, um, rising sentiments against the United States, um, is often considered in the United States as um, a response to U.S. actions. That it is somehow provoked by the mistakes made by U.S. foreign policy or uh, its economic relations. And I hope you consider an alternative and that is that anti-Americanism in some cases, certainly I believe that it is uh, uh, the case for these countries, is a tool that is used by governments that are interested in preserving uh, a type of regime that is undemocratic. It becomes a tool to justify and preserve abuses of power. Now, you don't have to believe it all the way, but I do want to be able to say that this is at least one way to consider this. And I want to do this by talking about uh, what I think are really the most anti-American uh, governments. Now, this talk almost uh, 10 years ago would have been unimaginable. 10 years ago, uh, uh, nobody was, in Latin America at least, was turning completely anti-American. And it seems that the number of countries that are turning anti-American um, is growing. And we don't know how many more countries are going to join this list. But I'm pretty sure that this list that's on, the, uh, on my first slide, Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia, are definitely on the side of, I don't know if you can all see this, uh, of uh, uh, anti-Americanism. Now, let me first begin by saying that currently Latin America is democratic in general, not Cuba, but they have presidents who were elected to office. And in the 2000s, we saw an interesting trend. We saw a trend of leftist governments coming to power through elections peacefully and changing governments. And these are some of the most prominent ones. And what you need to be able to understand is that variations in anti-Americanism exist. That we have countries that are leftist governments, such as Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay, that are absolutely pro-US. And then there's some that are a little bit more moderate anti-US. But then we have Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia. I added Nicaragua. I'm not going to talk about Nicaragua. But essentially, this isn't necessarily the, an exclusive, this isn't necessarily what you get when you get leftist politics in Latin America. There is a small category of leftist regimes that are also intensely anti-American. And let me begin a little bit by, you know, here they are. Uh, uh, Hugo Chavez, president of, of uh, 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 Venezuela, Fidel Castro and Evo Morales. And back here we have the, the, the second time president of Nicaragua, uh, uh, Daniel Ortega. But here they are, they're having a good time. They are uh, thinking about uh, an alliance, an alliance against the United States and capitalism. And uh, let me begin by, by saying something about Cuba. Um, on Cuba, you know, we tend to think that, we have an, that Cuba is suffering from a U.S. embargo, and it is. But what most people don't realize is that there is a second embargo in Cuba imposed by the government. It's a very tough embargo. It's an embargo on the lives of citizens. And essentially, it's a list of prohibitions, that innocent, prohibitions on things that innocent folks can carry out. And I want you to get an appreciation of how ordinary these activities are the ones that are banned in Cuba as a result of what the state does. You cannot travel abroad, you cannot change your jobs, change residence, access the internet, 
have private education for your children, watch independent private radio or TV stations, buy books uh, from an independent bookstore. There are no independent libraries. If the ones that exist are tiny and very living in precarious conditions. You cannot receive publications from abroad. You, up until very recently, couldn't even go to a, a, a hotel for tourists or restaurant for tourists. You cannot seek employment with foreign companies unless you get the permission of the state. You cannot run for a public office unless you are approved by the Communist Party. You cannot own a business. You cannot transact with property. In other words, if you have something and you cannot easily sell it in the market. Um, you cannot join an independent labor union. You don't have the right to retain a lawyer unless approved by the government. You don't get to choose your physician or your hospital. You cannot refuse to participate in mass rallies. And of course, you cannot criticize the regime. All right. Now, this is as totalitarian as it gets in the 21st century. And in many ways, one of the reasons why the, US, the, the, the Cuban government is happy with the persistence of the US embargo, the restrictions that we have on conducting trade with Cuba, is because they are intensely fearful that if Americans begin to go, they are going to have to somehow to relax all these uh, other restrictions. The argument is not that I'm making is not that the aggression from the United States is causing the secondary embargo. The secondary embargo is the reason that the government needs to have a policy of aggression from the United States. Cuba is today a very good example of uh, a country that is embracing a false foreign policy. Its declared foreign policy is we're against the US embargo. But deep down, they would like the embargo to continue because it is this embargo that allows the government to feed into the diehards, the most nationalist sectors, and to be able to remain somewhat exempt from the pressure that would exist otherwise. Now, because of this secondary embargo, and here there's a dispute, many people think that it's the US embargo that is causing Cuba's poverty. I would argue that it's not the US embargo, but the secondary embargo that the Cuban government has imposed that is causing this poverty. And this is the chart that I want you to look at. Um, this is from 1950 to 1998, growth rates. Uh, and we have several countries, but uh, this line here is Cuba, a horrible performance flat and declining downwards all the way down to 98. Latin America, the totality of Latin American countries, Cuba in the 1950s was richer than most Latin American countries than the average. It has gone down and Latin America has been going up, up, up and Cuba is staying further down. Um, this is Chile and so in some ways, in some ways, um, what is interesting is that this decline, this secular long-term economic immiseration of the island of Cuba existed even when there was a patron, the Soviet Union subsidizing Cuba. So clearly even when the effects of the embargo were not that present and visible because the USSR was rescuing Cuba, um, Cuba was declining in part because of these uh, uh, draconian laws that essentially wipe out self-initiative in the country. So one way to think about Cuba is that Cuba is like a corporation that has a product in the market and that product is anti-Americanism. And the claim is that anti-Americanism is good for you. But this is a picture of a grocery store in Cuba, has nothing except for flags and the picture of Fidel. So this brand kind of became out of favor in the late 1990s because it seemed like it was saying it didn't being this anti-American entails so much hardship that you may want to think of it as, you know, when we say, you know, going to the gym and being on a diet is good for you. Uh, that's kind of what this became, appealing to just a minority. Not a, not a small minority of uh, radicals in the world, but clearly not a majoritarian sentiment. And this was essentially the panorama in Cuba right around the time that our next contender for anti-Americanism in Latin America came up, and that was Hugo Chavez, uh, president of Venezuela, elected in 1999, excuse me, 1998, and came into office in 1999, and has been in office in Venezuela since then. Um, what Venezuela is doing is 
modernizing the brand. Excuse me? The new slo slogan is, you too can have a Hummer. Um, the reason is that with the rise of Hugo Chavez, uh, something remarkable happened in, interna in the international political economy, and that was a boom in the price of oil starting in 2003. And this boom in oil uh, produced the most dramatic economic expansion in the history of Venezuela, and I would even argue in the history of Latin America. Let me show you, uh, um, let me skip this slide, but um, here you have an idea. Venezuela is the only true petrostate in the Americas. In other words, it's the one and only country that has an enormous surplus of oil, and it can export it in huge amounts. And um, this is, I'm sorry that it is in Spanish, uh, real oil income in Venezuela. Uh, the oil is owned by the government, so this is all income for the government. And what you see is Venezuela from 1962 to 2007. Chavez comes into office right around here. Um, first uh, oil shock of the 1970s, the second one. And then Venezuela was suffering depressed oil prices. Chavez comes in here. And essentially by 2003, you see this amazing windfall. Well, what he has tried to convince people is that unlike the Cuban brand of anti-Americanism, this one is going to bring good things to you, materially speaking. And so this is a government that rather than saving for a rainy day, the way that the IMF would recommend countries would manage their, their, their affairs, they began to spend beyond even the revenues that they were getting so that they were also generating debt. And, um, and this um, allowed the government in Venezuela to begin to concentrate power, even though it was a democratically elected. The state became so capable of co-opting folks who would have never been, who would have never wanted to be near a, 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 a leftist regime. Because what you have here is the coincidence of socialism with a consumption boom, almost unheard of in the history of socialism. And in Venezuela, it's brought to you thanks to the president of the country, Hugo Chavez. It's an enormous expansion of, the, of spending. Uh, GD, GNP went from 18 to 30% between 1999 to 2007. That is an enormous amount, generating a lot of growth. An important aspect, a lot of people focus on the impact that this is having on the poor and the debate as to whether he is using some of this fiscal stimulus to actually bring people out of poverty. But the more interesting aspect is um, what is happening with impunity. When you have a regime that is this um, lavish with its spending, um, one of the things that begins to happen is that people compete to get contracts from the government, multi-million dollar contracts, and very few of these contracts are handed out as a result of bidding. And certainly no auditing and uh, obviously, obviously corruption. Um, if you don't have a bidding process and if you don't have mechanisms for auditing this, you are leaving a lot of room for um, basically kickbacks. The the, a state official tells you, you know, we have a contract for this and the contract goes to that private agent who can return uh, to the state some kind of a favor of some sort. And the point of this is that this fiscal spending, which many folks in the world find admirable for what it's doing for the poor, it's even more admirable for what it's doing for the rich, <laughs> for the elites. And so inequality in Venezuela is rising. Uh, um, and of course, with a brand of um, hate speech, those who like the gym and those who like diets and diehard radicals, you know, it could be a small percentage of the country, but this is one reason why you have this ideology. Uh, now, one of the things that Chavez has also tried to do is that because he knows that when there is economic growth, incumbents, you know, the opposition forces can become stronger, what he has done during this entire process is not just uh, inundate the country with inducements, but impose increasing restrictions on political and civil liberties. Uh, the list is very long, but uh, most political scientists agree that what you have in Venezuela is 
an example of how economic growth can be used not to breed democracy but to breed a certain type of autocracy because it has empowered the state to co-opt so many agents that it becomes very difficult for anybody to really fight back and the state simultaneously uh, uh, accumulates more and more power in the executive branch. Basically you eliminate all forms of checks and balances. There is no Supreme Court independence. The electoral bodies are uh, taken over. The uh, powers of the legislature are completely reduced. They are now persecuting members of the opposition in a light way. So this is perhaps the second adaptation of the Cuban model of anti-Americanism and that is not only can you buy a Hummer, finally in Venezuela, but we're going to have a light version of the totalitarianism that you have in Venezuela. We're not going to have this second embargo, but we're just going to have so much concentration of power that any notions of horizontal accountability or vertical accountability, checks and balances of any sort, constitutional government of any sort is unimaginable. Uh, look, you know, uh, countries in the world, all of them have constitutions and a lot of people wonder when they read constitutions about the rights of citizens and I think that's not a waste of time to find out how constitutions affect citizens or not. But what you always want to be able to evaluate with constitutions is do they restrain the power of the executive branch? That's the whole reason for constitution is to limit the powers of those with more power and those are the forces that occupy the executive branch. And when you see in Venezuela, uh, uh, let me show you right here, is a, a, a steady process of, this is an index of constitutional changes in Latin America, and it is an index that goes from zero, zero to one, one being a constitution that concentrates excessive power in the hands of the president, that would be uh, maximum uh, absolute power would get the score of one. Zero would be a country where there is no presidential power at all. So in, in, a, in, in, in a diagram like this one, uh, there would be very few countries here and only the most totalitarian countries would be here. Uh, democracies would somehow s stay somewhere right in the middle. And what you see with Venezuela is that the constitution that the regime started with in 1999 already moved in this direction of expanding the powers of the president. These were the formal prerogatives that Chavez has used since then to then go farther into concentrating uh, more and more power. But what is interesting is that he was able to do this precisely because it is the first time that anti-Americanism and anti-capitalism has come with you too can buy a Hummer. Uh, uh, people are having one of the best economic uh, experiences in Venezuela in decades. And this changed the political panorama. And so just to repeat, because it's worth repeating, um, um, this is one of the first episodes in which um, the brand name of anti-Americanism is being used while at the same time generating uh, a, a consumption boom. But a consumption boom that is also uh, uh, coming accompanied by uh, 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 an escape, uh, a concentration of power. Now, let me show you this other slide. Um, these are um, Chavez's approval ratings. We're familiar with approval ratings in this country. And uh, Chavez is this line uh, from the beginning. And so what you have is w right after Chavez approved that very presidentialist constitution, his approval ratings went down. Venezuelans didn't like this at all. And during this period, Chavez was facing enormous political opposition. But notice where the change happens. Right around 2003, his approval ratings begin to go back up to levels of like 71%. We can almost mark this turnaround by identifying the, 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 the beginning of the uh, 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 boom in oil prices. It was very effectively used in order to advance uh, uh, this political project and be uh, popular. So that you have what we call a competitive autocracy. It is an autocracy because it is concentrating a lot of power in the hands of the president and undermining mechanisms of checks and balances, but it is competitive. People like it and it wins elections so it doesn't abolish elections. 
it's just impossible for the opposition to defeat a government that is spending this much with this trio of inducements that I described. And so Chavez, to this day, remains still very popular with 67 approval rates. And folks who are in the opposition feel somewhat, somewhat demoralized because they don't think that this is going to come to an end anytime soon. Now, what Chavez has also done, and this is interesting, is that he discovered, he discovered that another way of adapting the Cuban model is instead of trying to export the revolution with guerrillas, let's just extend the policy of inducements extended abroad into its neighbors. And so Chavez is, Venezuela under Chavez, I think has become the one and only petrostate in the world that has the most lavish foreign policy uh, of all the countries that I know. It is the Chavez regime since 2004 has been producing almost 70 billion in international spending. This is a huge amount of money. I mean, just to give you an idea, the bailout, the initial package of the U.S. bailout was uh, in the neighborhood of 700 billion. And, you know, it's almost 10 percent of that, you know, it, so that you get an idea of how massive this is uh, for a small country like Venezuela of 29 million people. And what this has done is that essentially, essentially, uh, nobody in Latin America would ever, ever dare to criticize this regime because everybody is now co-opted somehow. Even if you're not co-opted, you are hoping that you might be. You're hoping, that, you're hoping that Chavez would pick up the phone and call you and offer you an oil subsidy of some sort. All right, but because this has a cost, and here's, here's Chavez's problem. This is a problem that Chavez has that Fidel Castro doesn't have. The nice thing about being a poor economy is that, you know, what do you care if you have bad economic news? But in Venezuela, because you're a rich economy, bad economic news can be very uh, taxing on the system. Here's what has happened. Uh, let me show you this slide. Um, again, this is in Spanish. This is Venezuela's crude production. It's a mega state. And here you have domestic consumption levels. About uh, right around this time, 0.5 million barrels of oil per day. And this is the historical production of oil. This is what the state-owned company does. This is what foreign partners do in terms of production. They sell this to the oil company, which then gets sold to international markets, mostly to the United States. But what has happened is the consumption boom is increasing domestic consumption of energy, while simultaneously we're seeing a decline in the production of oil over time. So that right now, the gap here is narrower than it has been historically. Now, why is production declining? It is declining because as part of their anti-Americanism, they have kicked out all the American oil companies and invited such top-notch corporations as the state oil company of Malaysia, Iran, Belarus, who have no experience whatsoever, no know-how in how you actually extract the type of crude that Venezuela has, which is heavy and with a high sulfuric content. And, uh, uh, and so they are seeing their most important milk cow uh, disintegrate before their eyes. All the while, domestic consumption is increasing. Domestic consumption is increasing because of the Hummers, it's true, uh, uh, and all the other cars that are being sold, but also because of smuggling. Ha ha. It's not just the elites in Venezuela who are enjoying this gig. Um, um, let me just give you an example. If you went to Venezuela and you wanted to fill up your tank, you would pay approximately 12 cents a gallon. In Colombia, the neighboring country, you would pay three dollars and fifty cents. Just think about what's going on in the Venezuelan Colombian border. <laughs> the level of smuggling that is taking place along the border is almost impossible to calculate and it's a drain on the economy. And who is in charge of this trade? The Venezuelan military and they are the ones who are involved in this. So it's not just the poor and it's not just the elites but the military establishment, and so it turns out that the military establishment loves Chavez uh, because of this situation. But 
what it means is that Chavez is incurring a cost. And this cost is, uh, um, let me show you this. This is, uh, again, Venezuela's oil exports divided by destination markets. The white bar is oil going to the United States, and these are um, uh, oil going to other countries. The first thing you see is this shrinkage, which is directly related to the previous slide. There is less oil that Venezuela is exporting. But also do notice that this bar shrinks a little bit proportionally. Back here, uh, the United States, actually it expands. Uh, the United States represented about 60% of Venezuela's main exports. Right around here, it became 65, the larger share of US exports. But many of these other barrels of oil that are being exported to other markets are being given away with a subsidy. And so they don't generate revenue. So essentially, this is almost a null figure for government revenues. The paradox, one more paradox, is that the government that is supposed to become more and more and more anti-American and hoping to lessen its dependence on the United States has never been more dependent. Currently, Venezuela has such an enormous dependent on the US market, despite the fact that it sells less oil for all the reasons that I was explaining. And what terrible drama this is for an anti-American. <laughs> they have to hide these figures. Terrible. Solution? Iran. Um, let me just show you this. Uh, Venezuela, like Iran, are members of OPEC, the oil exporting country. Venezuela is a founding member of OPEC, and it's a big member. Here are the list of the top oil producers in the world. Take a look at the number one category, unbeatable Saudi Arabia. Big, big, big guy in OPEC. Then comes Russia, not a member of OPEC. The United Arab Emirates, member of OPEC. Norway, not a member of OPEC. And then comes Iran. Kuwait, member of OPEC. And then comes Venezuela. OPEC is currently divided ideologically. One faction led by Saudi Arabia arguing that the price of oil has to be kept affordable. Because if it becomes too unaffordable, as in fact it did three months ago, you depress world demand. That's not the foreign policy of Venezuela and Iran. Iran, like Venezuela, is seeing a decline in its oil production. And its only solution would be either to invite Americans to drill baby drill, which they're not going to do, or maximize the price of oil somehow. Anti-Americanism has led to this alliance between Venezuela and Iran to form a huge bloc, and hopefully other countries, like uh, uh, they wanna, uh, they're starting to recruit other countries, to balance Saudi Arabia. Now, they don't want to destroy OPEC, so this means that Chavez is not going to be Al-Qaeda against Saudi Arabia, because it's not that uh, they recognize that it's important to have the cartel. But there is one explanation for the mysterious alliance between Venezuela and Iran is precisely to bond Saudi Arabia and to maintain a policy of maximizing the price of oil. Now, one more paradox, paradox if I may. For a nation that claims to be so pro-poor, a foreign policy of maximizing oil, which we know hurts low-income groups than almost anybody, uh, any, any other uh, 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 price uh, commodity uh, seems to be a contradiction. The current policy is of Venezuela is kind of similar to Amherst. We raise tuition and then we offer some subsidies to those who want to be our friends. Well, that's the Venezuelan version, but it's kind of the same strategy. Keep the price of oil very, very high, but then go around the world distributing subsidies. It's an amazing foreign policy. It is the Chavez doctrine, if you will, in foreign policy. Uh, um, and what is so interesting is that most people on the left think that this is such a progressive government that's truly standing up to the Americans. And what I hope you can understand is that a lot of uh, the intentions of the governments are being contradicted, and those intentions being to help the poor at home, at home as well as abroad. All right. Let's do Venezuela. I've talked. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> No, is the party over in Venezuela? Um, we might have noticed that the price of oil has come down from its high point of $145 down right around here in October of uh, 08. Now, notice, this is very bad for Venezuela. 
In other words, the policy of maximizing the price of oil is in trouble now. This is still a very good price. This is still, you know, a historical high. But because Venezuela overcommitted, it feels desperate at this point. We're starting to see a change in Chavez's position. Up until this point, Chavez was feeling comfortable owning the world at home and abroad. But now, he's starting to feel cornered. And folks in Washington are following this, and they think that now we can worry. Now we should be worrying about this, because it is when these regimes feel cornered, feel somewhat in trouble, that some of the most reckless policies can come about. Uh, and by reckless, I mean not just form an alliance with Iran in OPEC to balance Saudi Arabia, but precipitate a crisis of some sort, maybe get uh, 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 um, somehow go crazy of some sort. And so in Washington, and rightly so, folks are finally a little bit nervous about this issue in Venezuela. Um, also, another reason why Chavez is a little cornered is because um, in 2007, there was an election for approval of a new constitution. The 1999 constitution was changed by the government unilaterally in the direction of more presidential powers. And the government, without consulting the opposition, proposed this in a referendum and it lost. And what this chart shows is it goes state by state in Venezuela um, and it shows these are the folks who voted for Chavez in the previous election, and these are the votes for the opposition in the previous election in 2006. And what you see is that Chavez lost a lot of support this time around in 2007, while the opposition either maintained its positions or even increased. And so Chavez lost three million folks. There's going to be an election now in November, and the government is terrified because this is the first time that they are beginning to feel that the competitive side of the label for this regime, competitive autocracy, competitive authoritarianism, might not work out. And so people are wondering what is going to happen this time if there is a defeat, a political defeat in a, an upcoming election. This is a scenario that the government never anticipated a year ago. So we'll be watching that situation. But it could very well be that the party in Venezuela is over, but that may not mean that the incumbents are going to lose power. If I had more time, I would develop this thesis. Uh, but the basic argument is that research in political science shows that economic crises do embolden opposition groups, weaken incumbents. That's true. But incumbents in autocracies tend to do much better surviving economic crises. And so there are tools that Chavez could still use to preserve its uh, 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 opposition in politics. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about um, um, uh, Venezuela, now Bolivia. What party? Um, they're not exactly having a party. They're on the verge of civil war. Uh, we're all watching at it. What point are we going to see it? Do you guys want to watch a four minute video? Yes. yes. <laughs> Let me see if I can. This is a video done by the opposition in Bolivia against the government of Evo Morales. And there is one scene that's going to be a little disturbing, some animal sacrifices. It'll be brief, but I won't stop until I get to it. I hope I have sound. However, two and a half years later, different facts tarnish social peace and endanger the democracy reaffirmed by popular vote. Bolivia is being led by a dictatorship toward the axis of undemocratic Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, countries that have established good relations with Iran. Evo Morales is an instrument that Hugo Chavez finances to achieve a total change in political systems in Latin America, 
generating violence, death, and chaos. Miners faced in Wanuni with a balance of tragic victims because the government strategically left them on their own. The prefecture of Cochabamba, burned by Kokali farmers and supporters of the ruling party, face the people and provoke new victims. Permission for community justice where people can take the law into their own hands. Armed paramilitary peasants from the ruling party called Red Ponchos present in a public parade. Messages of encouragement from the Vice President of the Republic, Alvaro Garcia Linera for supporters of the ruling party to use weapons. Lo más suyo es la patria y defenderá con su pecho, con su mano, con la piedra, con la coragua, con el mauser, defenderá esta revolución, estos cambios y este gobierno revolucionario. Sacrificed butchered dogs symbolizing the opponents of the government and pronouncing death threats. Attempted military occupation of the airport of Santa Cruz with repression of the people, authorities, and journalists. Drafting of a constitution of the Republic solely by the mass constituents within a military barracks and intimidation of the constituents of the opposition, breaking all constitutional laws and not respecting the approval by two-thirds as instructed by the Constitution. Opposition to the departmental autonomies, legitimately won through referendums in four departments. Violence in Sucre because of extreme police repression directed by a government minister with a new toll of victims and damage to public property. Attacks on journalists by police instructed from the House of Government. Preventing the opposition from attending Congress, passing two laws that infringe on departmental autonomy, and cutting the budget of the regions that are not in agreement with the government. The Congress continues to pass law by using its usual practices. Social movements related to the government constructed a human barrier to prevent with violence the opposition legislators from sitting in the National Congress. the continuing aggression against foreign countries by the government and the use of social movements as the first impact force, resulting in blockades and threats to the U.S. Embassy, symbolic burnings and dangerous speeches. The Agency for International Development, USAID, is expelled from part of the national territory by Bolivian coca farmers. The government of Evo Morales supports the actions of the cocaleros and defends the free planting of the leaf beyond the interests of local communities. Now I feel, hopefully, that the free planting of the leaf is not only a territory of analphabetism, but that it is a territory of the imperialism of the North American zone of the Tropic of Cochabamba. Okay, let's stop here. I... The president repeated interventions against the government of Alan Garcia. Now I need to go back to... Okay, let me skip this and uh, for the sake of time. What you're seeing in Bolivia is a country where a majority...
one power. And in some ways, Bolivia is a very peculiar country in Latin America because it is predominantly indigenous. And it was a person such as Evo Morales who was able to campaign as first a coca leaf grower and then an indigenous movement together with socialists, with nationalists and folks who were against a, a traditional political parties. He built a massive coalition that was supposed to bring the end of apartheid for Bolivia, and I don't want to push that analogy that far, but it was an incredibly democratic moment, a wonderful cross-sectional uh, coalition of many folks who supported the regime. But, you know, it won 56, 60 percent of the vote, and what happened is they tried to imitate the Venezuela model of concentrating power in the hands of the people and its president. And what occurred, something that did not happen in Venezuela, is that um, a coalition resurfaced, or a coalition surfaced, uh, that was led by the eastern provinces of Bolivia. The eastern provinces of Bolivia are richer, so they have resources, and they feel that this project of the majorities is going to turn very punitive. And because the uh, 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 other provinces have resources, they immediately tried to resist this, and their protest became enormously successful. Uh, in some ways, this is what happened. Uh, the regions began to say, against concentration of power, what we want is federalism. Let the provinces do whatever they want to do, uh, because there's too much concentration of power. This is typical in constitutional moments. And the government said no. And this produced a huge civil war. Now, uh, all I wanted to say is that what is interesting is that there are some folks who are not members of the Masista coalition who are here, but this force is especially strong because it was able to cut into important constituents of Evo Morales. But what this means is that this is pre-civil war in Bolivia. And it's a civil war that could be the first, we don't have it there yet, but it could be the first case in South America of secession because we don't know whether these provinces are going to decide at some point, all right, we're not going to fight for federalism, we're going to fight instead for independence. We're not there yet, but if we get to that point, I think that would be the first time that we have to deal in the Western Hemisphere with a secessionist movement uh, since either Texas or <laughs> Panama. Uh, Panama is, uh, is probably the last one. Um, and, but, but the video is biased. But it's done by the opposition. This is how the opposition feels. Now, they see the government repressing, but did we see the military? No. Social movements. This, has, this is such a tsunami of civilians, poor indigenous, that are doing the hitting. And you see statements of the government saying, you know, that's what the people want, and we're not going to contain it. There is the argument that the state is deliberately uh, 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 is losing control or stimulating its own forces to become uh, aggressors against the opposition. And this is going to produce, of course, a backlash. What else would you expect? And so there is a brink of civil war. But again, why all of a sudden anti-imperialism, as if this were necessary, um, the, Chavez, the, the Morales government would have a long list of complaints. But for the most part, it is very important to unite a force and especially to keep the nationalists and the socialists together because many of these folks did not like the concentration of power that the president implemented. And they have the, there is the risk of them defecting and Morales just becoming a coalition of these guys. And so it is very important to have anti-Americanism to see whether they can retain this ring. It's a political strategy. And so we don't know what's going to happen in Bolivia, but again, the thesis is that you exaggerate anti-Americanism in order to have some kind of political result, and especially in a situation where the political outcome that you want to uh, bring about is concentration of power. Where do we go from here? Um, there's a huge dilemma for U.S. foreign policy when it comes to dealing with this intense anti-Americanism in the region, especially if you are a candidate like Obama. Obama has said that he wants to lessen anti-Americanism in the world, and who's against that? Um, but if you believe my argument, 
if you believe my argument that rather than anti-Americanism causing abuse of power, that abuse of power needs anti-Americanism, how can you devise a foreign policy to deal with this? It seems that if you appease these governments, you have to then accept abuse of power. And if you want to criticize abuse of power, you will then feed the anti-Americanism, which is politically expedient. It's a terrible trap. It's one more trap that the next president is going to face. And especially coming from a party, if it's Obama, that happens to be in the business of diminishing these two things in the world. And in some ways, I'm not sure that with these type of intense anti-American governments that use anti-Americanism uh, for domestic purposes, there really is uh, 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 a solution to this. Um, let me, before I finish, express my gratitude to my research assistants, uh, Octavia Fuarta, Sam Grau, Tara Shebahan, Carlos Sabatino, all of you who helped me. Thank you very much. And to you for coming, thank you also. All right, so we have, we have time for questions and answers. Maybe just questions. <laughs> Why don't I take a couple so that I can hear uh, since, yes. I'm sorry I missed the, the part about Cuba, but one thing, is, uh, an observation about the foreign policy of um, Venezuela seems to be like the United States foreign policy. You use your resources, be it military or financial, to influence other countries. And the general situation, at least my observation of U.S. Um, relations with countries in, in that part of the world is that the United States has used their power to undermine their those governments. So there's, there's, you know, you don't have to create an anti-Americanism if there's a history. In other words, in the, in the case of Cuba, the United States has been consistently trying to undermine the Cuban government. I mean, you don't have to create, you know, sort of opposition, you know, the opposition to America. And even with the, when the, um, the Venezuelan, they had that little problem with them over, trying to overtake uh, Chavez, the United States government, you know, you, when you have these small countries, the government is paying, you know, the U.S. pays, pays quote-unquote, opposition. Who's real opposition? You know, how do you know what's local opposition and what's foreign-inspired uh, opposition? Um, thank you. That was exactly the argument I was trying to challenge. <laughs> uh, I, it didn't work. Um, um, <laughs> people don't learn from professors. <laughs> um, this is the debate. Uh, is this being provoked by U.S. actions or is this really uh, um, something that these governments create in order to be able to concentrate more power and to find someone to blame? Um, you know how I feel. Uh, on the question of whether this is exactly how the United States acts, be careful. When we give aid or when we make investments, private investments is subject to a lot of auditing in international courts and even in the United States. And foreign aid gets scrutinized by our politicians. The numbers are there, it's transparent. This is one of the biggest changes in development, increasing auditing of aid. The Venezuelan oil aid is aid that comes without conditionalities in, and without mechanisms for checking uh, uh, what happens to it. It's given more unaccountably, and I think that is not a small difference. But you're right. You're right that it is emulating a traditional tool of big powers that is, you know, go out there and try to exercise influence through economic goodies. The remarkable thing about Venezuela is that for a country of its size, and even for petrostates, nobody else is doing it. Very few other petrostates are being this, this, uh, uh, giving this much money away as, as Chavez is. I would say that uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, um, uh, uh, in some ways, it's an, exporting, an export of corruption, not just oil, that characterizes the regime. Uh, there were some questions. Yes. Uh, what, is life, uh, what would it be like to be an American tourist right now in Bolivia? I wouldn't go, <laughs> unless you know someone there. Um, well, you know, I think uh, 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 it's considered to be a country that at any moment is going to have uh, an outbreak of more intense conflict. I don't think we're going to see a real war as in uh, South Africa, excuse me, as in Africa, in some many African countries. But it's the most unstable country in the region right now and we don't know what's next. Um, now, I've been to Bolivia, and I didn't see any violence. <laughs> I read about it, uh, so I was pretty immune to it this past uh, year, but you know, uh, I think going for a week is perfectly fine. Be prepared for staying a little longer in case they shut down the airport for a few days. 
Uh, um, but it is, it is, it, there is n no comparable level of political upheaval in Latin America at the moment uh, uh, next to Bolivia. Yeah. But are Bolivians one-on-one -on -one anti american or is it just a chaotic situation? Because when you go to Cuba as an American... They love you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I think that whereas anti-Americanism in the Cuban population is exhausted, depleted, long gone, and now they love Americans, they love Americans, Palin would be very happy there. <laughs> in Bolivia, in Bolivia, uh, I do think that um, the, the, the radicals, anti-Americanism is a stronger movement, that the mass movement feels this, I mean, it, it sympathizes with this aspect of the government. It's not a majoritarian sentiment by far, but again, as those of us who like gym and diet, um, uh, it's not a small contingency. Yes. I'm always concerned with the notion that we have anti-American investments in the United States, which we then purchase from, and, I, and then I'm kind of at a conflict, first of all, whether I even know which of those interests do represent anti-American businesses. And as citizens, Um, I, I think, is it Sitco that's owned by Shell? Yes. Right. Um, I mean, that's a, a, a good example. There is, at the moment, a discussion in Venezuela, in the United States. There has been, and will, there will be another one, discussion as to whether we should cut off oil purchases from Venezuela on the basis of national security. Why should we be financing a government that declares itself to be our enemy? Um, this is an argument that conservatives can go very far with. And um, the problem is that if you take an action like this, it would be interpreted so belligerent that what you do is you change the political dynamic in that country away from a struggle between a government that is concentrating power and the opposition versus the empire against a small nation. And so it has a huge risk. Fortunately, I happen to think that uh, the last three or four years, our foreign policy to Venezuela has been to resist that temptation in part because trying to stop sales to, trying to, to stop oil from coming would increase the price of oil. But I think there's also been some judiciousness on the part of some folks in the administration uh, that uh, you don't want to add fuel to this fire. And uh, it's the trap that we're in with anti-Americanism. Uh, we are left with few policy tools. Um, um, One, well, you know, again, but uh, autocrats have mechanisms of surviving economic crisis. So I'm not sure that the problem of governance in Venezuela is on its way out. But um, uh, the good news is that Chavez has nowhere to turn to sell its oil. Uh, uh, and so it, it's not going, to, we're not going to see an embargo uh, from Venezuela to us uh, uh, in, in, in the near term. Yes, sir. What does Chavez do in terms of his strategy on pricing? OPEC is meeting right now in terms of, and, and trying to decide whether to cut production in order to stop the free fall in, in oil prices. And he needs to, to have prices up, but it's at the cost of production coming down. Now, his curve is coming down on, on internal production. Maybe that fits a bit. But it's only going to work if he can somehow maintain a better spread on, on production than, than the cut that's happening elsewhere or the revenue just keeps on flooding down. Precisely. Um, the, the strategy is to convince other OPEC members to cut supplying the market, cut supplies. Um, uh, and this is, cartels are very bad with this policy in general. Because if you diminish the supply, then other actors outside of OPEC are going to try to come in. And so you, you uh, undermine your own actions. But this is exactly the strategy. Given that they cannot reverse the decline in domestic production, the only tool that they have left is maximizing the price of oil. But he's going to have to have some additional cuts himself in, what, if he's, as part of OPEC, presumably. Yeah, he, but, but that's fine with him because he has less oil. And if, the, if it keeps the price of oil high, it compensates for the uh, uh, cutbacks in oil. Where you're going to see Venezuela, what you're going to see in Venezuela by the end of 2009 is a devaluation. Um, and that's going to be the way that he's going to adjust. By devaluing, you know, if before the devaluation, one dollar of oil revenue gave you two bolivares, after a devaluation, depending on how far it goes, one dollar might give you three bolivares, and that allows you to 
boost spending, generate inflation, but it saves you uh, temporarily. It's, it's a terrible economic policy, but it, it, it uh, uh, gets you out of the uh, uh, precarious economic situation that they're going to find themselves in a year. Yes. Yeah, it's, these are the, uh, um, this slide that I show is the result of that referendum with the um, uh, government losing uh, voters across state. And that was a terrible, terrible defeat for the government. But didn't it prevent Chavez from running for president? Right. Um, you know, term limits exist in constitutions. And the constitution was being changed. One of the changes was to allow for indefinite reelection, And that got defeated. He said after that that he's going to find other ways. <laughs> you know, if the Constitution bans you from it, you find something else, and who knows. Uh, but this is, this is the most important prize that he didn't get because it is the one thing that governments find harder to do. They can get away with a lot of other abuses, but the issue of term limits is, is something that they care a lot about, and yet they do need the Constitution to allow it, or, or, or who knows what else they might do. Yeah. Yes, back there. Oh, I'm sorry. I think this gen I'm sorry. This gentleman, uh, you wanted to ask your question. Um, there's been a lot in thinking for decades, particularly among lay people like myself, that once Castro and his generation passed, that there would be a change in the government. Is this a myth from a political science of people? Um, because Venezuela is being bailed out. Excuse me. Because Colum because Cuba is being bailed out by Venezuela. Um, you have reduced the incentives that might have existed to accept the end of the U.S. embargo because there are a lot of folks in the government right now who are doing, making a lot of money. And so they don't have an economic incentive anymore to welcome uh, a rapprochement. Uh, everybody thought that Raul Castro, who to the disbelief of most Cubans is the president of Cuba, uh, Fidel's brother, was going to bring this opening, but he didn't, and in part is because He's not facing an economic crisis now. Venezuela is in charge of that. Venezuela's foreign policy toward Cuba is to make sure that nobody feels the pinch, to make sure that the political class does not feel the pinch of the embargo and therefore generate an appetite for uh, trade with the United States. And, and this is deliberate on their part. Yeah? Yes, you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, well, I was more interested in your talk if you had lined up some of your criticisms with Venezuela, with Colombia, because a lot of the things that you're saying about Uribe, like the term limits, Uribe also changed his constitution. He uses paramilitaries the same way that you're saying um, Morales is using in Bolivia. But uh, I, what I wanted to ask is, have you ever thought about like lining up those kinds of things? Because I think using the anti-Americanism as your title, it's my experience with Latin America is more anti-imperialism and anti-Yankeeism well, or something like that. Isn't that too broad a stroke given the context of the U.S. supporting dictators, overthrowing democratically elected governments, um, having military presence in Colombia in, on the borders of Colombia, Venezuela, and, and Colombia and Ecuador? So that's what, you know, we don't see that. They see that. So it seems like your, your slideshow doesn't put into context the historical context and the military presence that the U.S. has in the region. Well, you know, there's no question that the United States has sided with dictators in Latin America. There's no question. I think that that's an, an unupdated view of the United States. The United States was instrumental in getting Pinochet out of office, has since supported democratic governments in general. Um, has uh, changed in many ways as a result of things done by the State Department and the Congress. I think you don't give enough credit to the United States, and I think this is an unupdated uh, view of the United States. Um, why didn't I discuss Colombia? I should have. I mean, the topic was anti-American governments. Autocratic governments, not all of them, become anti-American. One way in which autocratic governments maximize their power is by bandwagoning with the United States, siding with the United States, and hoping not to receive criticism from the United States. That's one approach. Another approach of autocrats is to, in, to do the exact opposite. Uh, 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 it's a different strategy. But I'm glad that you, I imagine that by comparing it to Uribe, you recognize how serious the problem is in Venezuela. Um, um, yes, in Colombia, um, um, he accepted a defeat uh, uh, for a referendum for term limits, an extension of term limits but he now wants 
to change it. He has very high approval ratings as well, uh, higher, far higher than Chavez's, um, 80%. And he, unfortunately, is going to want to use that political capital to try to disrupt the Constitution. And I think this is going to be very bad news. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you, uh, you gave a very good explanation as to the internal logic of the uh, embargo on the Cuban, the mentioned Cuban point of view. Um, and yet, no U.S. president so far has been proactive in terminating the embargo. Could you address the, uh, the logic of the United States in maintaining the embargo? <laughs> um, I don't think I could do it in one minute. Uh, but let me just say that, let me say this, it's very interesting. Currently, the political forces in this country in favor of lifting the embargo have never been higher. And that includes the farm lobby, the oil lobby, the construction lobby, the financial sector, the uh, tourism lobby, and many evangelical churches. They're all in the Republican Party. <laughs> And yet, it's the Republican Party that gives you uh, uh, this policy of uh, restriction. Uh, this is hard to explain. I have my own hypothesis, but it is an amazing act of betraying your constituencies. Um, um, in fact, even the toughening of the embargo under Bush betrayed some of the things that Cuban Americans wanted to do. Cuban Americans want, many Cuban Americans want, an embargo against trade with the state but more human-to-human -human contact, sort of like a return to the Reagan doctrine in dealing with the Soviet Union. And Bush not only tightened the embargo against the Cuban state, but also restricted human-to-human -human contacts, and in doing so, upset many Cuban Americans. So, so I wouldn't even go as far as some cliches go in saying that the policy exists because of this is what Cuban American wants. Even the current policy is not wholeheartedly supported by Cuban Americans. So, uh, all I've done is to highlight a mystery rather than solve it for you, uh, uh, but I don't have more time. One more, back there, yes. Yes. I worry about that because it's less of a real threat to the United States, the, the type of uh, military support that Russia could do uh, will never mean anything militarily against the United States, but it's such an act of provocation. We have folks in government whose job it is to make war plans and to be prepared for this. And thank God we have them. Why would you want a military if, it did, if they wouldn't do these war plans? And the moment you have this type of cooperation, you trigger a response from that side that it's very toxic. And that's why I worry about it, because it, it is one thing that is going to risk putting an end to the policy of live and let live that the United States has been implementing since 2005. I see it as a deliberate act of provocation with, for no other purpose than to get the Americans to turn more hardliners. And I worry about that because that trick can that that can do the trick uh, more so than almost anything else. More so, more so than supporting the FARCs, uh, bringing the Russians in will be a game changer, uh, and um, because it brings so few benefits to this revolution, uh, I can all, I cannot rule out the fact that it is ex uh, exclusively a, a, a deliberate provocation. To, to end the policy that, uh, the, that Venezuela does not like, which is a policy of ignoring the country. Yeah? Uh, one more, and then you guys are still here. Yeah, one more, and then we, gotta go. we gotta go. Okay, uh, uh, Chavez and, and the, uh, uh, getting closer to Russia is part of this movement towards uh, staying uh, a large percentage of this uh, uh, gross domestic product on, uh, on weapons. Um, how do you see that uh, within the context of Latin America? Is he starting an arms race in Latin America? He will. Well, he's not starting it. Latin America is going to have an arms race. Uh, well, who knows, now that the world economy is collapsing. Um, but, you know, six months ago, um, I think most analysts were saying it's about time. These, de these democracies spent the late 80s and 1990s and early 2000s restraining their military spend expenditures. And that, we knew, was going to end at some point. Um, 
Venezuela um, uh, is ahead of the game. Well, one could say that Colombia was uh, number one in this situation because of the drug uh, problem and, and how they boosted uh, military spending. And so now comes Venezuela. So I wouldn't necessarily say that Venezuela is the cause but it will certainly uh, accelerate this process. And frankly, in the region, we don't have a protocol for dealing with weapons modernization. The natural tendency of states from now on, even democracies, to uh, begin to go on a shopping spree for, for, for weapons. This is, and it's unfortunate that uh, uh, as a hemisphere, we have a very soft regime to deal, international regime of cooperation, to monitor this so that it doesn't inspire mistrust uh, given that I think is now uh, 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 weapons modernization is going to be inevitable. It's not scaring the Colombians, actually, interestingly. I don't know why not, but uh, they're, they're not too scared. All right. Well, you guys have been terrific. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time. Thank you for your questions.